Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this lecture on critical and radical social work. Um, this is a slightly abbreviated version of the original lecture to make it a little bit more um, manageable for the purposes of the collaboration. So I hope that you enjoy it and that some of it's familiar to you and that some of it is new to you. So let's get going. So the, the lecture will cover briefly the critical social science paradigm. We'll look at what is critical and radical social work, neoliberalism in the South African context, and then the importance of social movements and social work, because for radical social work to be able to engage, often that happens at a um, macro level and social movements are really important, especially in the South African context. Of course, the slogan of critical and radical social work is that another world is possible. And you'll notice a little logo on the right hand side, which says Social Work Action Network, that is SWAN. Um, there are links to web pages and Facebook where you can read more and I will be mentioning the Social Work Action Network again. It's an international organization and there are various um, networks um, throughout, all over the world actually. The strongest one in um, America being the one in Boston. And so you'll be able to see that if you'd like. So first of all, we need to pose the question, do we contribute to or hinder the struggle for social justice and a better world as social workers, of course? Um, we often find ourselves in roles of maintaining the status quo and of working towards social control. A lot of the work that we do um, finds itself positioned in those sort of functions. And there might be reasons for why we fail in our purpose of working towards social justice. And that might be um, possibly our workplace where we are concerned about the safety or the, the, um, the protection of our employment or the state if we work for the state and um, they're very rigid rules about what we can involve ourselves with. On the other hand, we might just accept dominant ideologies without question, or it might actually be really uncomfortable to challenge our own ide ideologies um, when we let ourselves really see what's happening in the world around us that can be really difficult to cope with. Um, it might also be difficult to face the reality of injustice and oppression. And so to begin with, we have to acknowledge that all helping is political. In South Africa, the, our roots of social work are to be found in colonialism and apartheid, um, and specifically in the well-being of white South Africans in the 19 20s and 30s, state policies um, meant that the so-called poor white question received a lot of attention. This changed after the transition from apartheid in 1994. Um, but it is also so that um, in South Africa, the historical legacy of apartheid and ongoing coloniality and current economic policies mean that social workers often have to um, work for social change outside of our professional roles um, in working hours outside of um, traditional social work. But on the other hand, um, there are ways to incorporate a critical and radical perspective in the work that we do. We do not have to accept the status quo. In South Africa, poverty is still racially stratified, stratified and we have the highest, most often, um, annually, the Gini coefficient shows that we have the highest inequality in the world. Of course, COVID-19 has exposed the existing fractures 
And so more than ever, we need a radical response. Um, some images, um, of course, the more extreme images, but the reason I'm showing you is that some of these images are related to areas where social movements are very active. This particular one was in Kennedy Road, and we will talk about that soon. This image shows specifically the illegal electricity connections where people are driven to um, having to use illegal means to try to get access to basic services that can be life-saving. During the COVID-19 pandemic and the worst of the lockdown, the questions were often asked, how on earth do people maintain social distance and where do they find running water that is clean to be able to wash their hands? Um, this quotation um, illustrates how our own ideological position actually affects the choices that we make professionally. And this relates to two very well-known figures in the South African context. The two men who were both psychologists, or that's a broad definition of psychology, but both of them worked in the field of the social sciences and human sciences who put to practice their professions in ways that made history and affected the lives of millions. One of them was Favort, who was a staunch white supremacist, a Nazi sympathizer and an avowed anti-Semite, and a leading architect of apartheid. Fanon, Franz Fanon, in contrast, was a relentless champion of social justice, who when he was barely 17, volunteered for the forces in France, attempting the liberation of France from Nazi occupation. And of course, Fanon went on to become a giant of a theorist, anti-colonial theorist, who is relied on extensively nowadays for our understandings of what the impact of colonization actually was. So what is critical and radical social work? First of all, it's work with people towards emancipation from oppression and inequality, importantly at both the individual and collective level. Um, it, it leads us to consistently and constantly um, use a critical perspective that questions, challenges and resists oppression. It involves critical conscientization and it involves solidarity, social action and collective action. I would really recommend that you read the short article by Vasilios Yokomides. Um, it is in the reference list that's from a Guardian newspaper in 2016. Importantly, though, is the critical social science paradigm. These are four sort of assumptions or propositions that enable us to have a lot of clarity about what is the perspective that we embrace when we adopt a radical perspective. First of all, it is that macro social structures shape social relations at every level of life. The world is divided between haves and have nots, people who have a lot and people who have very little. And the argument is that the interests of these two groups are opposed and irreconcilable. We understand that those that have a lot don't want to give anything up. And of course, those that don't have desperately for survival do need um, resources. A controversial one is that the oppressed are complicit in their oppression, but only to the extent um, that that might be true with ongoing oppression. Of course, people don't choose to become oppressed in the first place, but um, the importance of understanding that people need to be supported sometimes um, towards, or fa facilitation needs to happen towards people developing agency. And so the fourth important assumption is that um, there must be an emphasis, an emphasis on people becoming empowered to act collectively for social change. And we know that when people act collectively, people become 
um, empowered to um, break and they, they develop that agency that allows them to break from their oppression. Um, just an important aside, in the critical and radical social work perspective, it's really important to um, consider um, views and perspectives on oppression. And of course, intersectionality is critically important in our understanding of how various kinds of oppression intersect to create hierarchies of, of people's struggle where they have multiple forms of oppression. And that um, perspective, as you probably know, um, developed from the feminist movement. But it is also important to understand or to see the perspective that um, we need to have a depth analysis and that we can't always cut loose oppression from its roots in capitalism. And that, in fact, all forms of oppression serve the interests of powerful elites. And if we, if we um, make different oppressions so separate that identity politics become the only way that we see oppression occurring. Um, it can neglect the understanding of how the state has a role in oppression, in the structures of oppression. And so collective action sometimes also becomes more difficult if we only use identity politics to understand oppression. Um, I think I'm going to skip this slide. I'm not going to go into a lot of depth here, except to say that Malcolm Payne is quite a useful writer for us for social work in trying to understand different kinds of social work theory. And um, it's useful to see social work theories in the various areas of analysis that they belong. Because what's really important is that we understand the ideological positions that our own theories that we select come from. Do we fall more on the side of the individual and the um, micro perspective, or do we lean more towards the collective? Do we lean more towards theories of radical change, or do we lean more towards theories of regulation? Similarly, it's useful to see social work theory in terms of a continuum where on the left hand side we could see the theories that are in fact oppressive themselves, um, theories that um, allow the social worker to hold the power and um, we, we act in oppressive ways, right through to um, the radical and structural change, the revolutionary theories that call for a complete um, transformation and system change. I'm very aware of time and um, I don't want to go over my more or less 30 minutes, so let me just check. I think we're doing fine. So I want to move on to a section on neoliberalism and inequality and social justice, which I know that you've covered quite extensively, but to bring it to the South African perspective, it might be useful just to stop for a moment and look at these. So as we know, inequality um, research has shown that levels of inequality, the increase, increasing levels of inequality go together with increasing social problems in societies. Um, Wilkinson and Pickett in 2014 did really interesting research um, globally, but from the vantage point of Britain and linked um, the social problems that, that occur concurrently with inequality. And the conclusion was reached that reducing inequality actually enhances social well-being of whole society. My problem with that a little bit is we should be re reducing inequality because it's socially unjust, not just to enhance everyone's well-being, um, although, of course, that would be a, a good outcome um, when that happens. In South Africa, the anti-apartheid struggle for liberation 
unfortunately became subsumed by the project of political e emancipation during the 1990s. And that's a really bad typing error. It's not 1994, it's 1994. The end of apartheid in 1994 with the first democratic elections brought liberation, it could be said, in the ideal and not in the material because the, the levels of socioeconomic inequality have remained the same. And there are many reasons for that that are difficult to go into right now, but the legacy of apartheid and of colonization before it um, continue because the structural dynamics in society are incredibly hard to break, especially when economically neoliberal policies were embraced at the time of that transition. And so our statutes, our legislation and policies have transformed significantly, but society has largely remained untransformed with extreme levels of poverty, which are still stratified by race. Um, the latest um, figures are that South Africa is among the top 40 wealthiest countries in the world, but is very low in the Human Development Index. And that goes to show that one can see if South Africa is a reasonably wealthy country, but inequality is so incredibly high, it shows that the wealth is concentrated among the elite, the, the small group of elite, um, and those are also the people that hold the power. And these are all considerations that demonstrate and um, in, in, emphasize the need for a radical approach. I'm sure that you um, have a lot of understanding about neoliberalism, but just to say that in the process, of the neoliberalization of the economy and of um, institutions, social workers in fact became bureaucrats with an increasing focus on statistics, of meeting certain targets, of reducing budgets and of actually um, maintaining that status quo and supporting it by working hard to save money. Um, of course, what's important as well in the South African context is that the neoliberal agenda with the state that became less interventionist and um, social security not achieving what it should be in terms of how much is being supported um, meant that the role for social work um, in this economic system has become really complex and social workers ask ourselves often, but what role can we play in the face of these difficulties? Um, just add by way of background, when the transition to democracy happened in 1994, um, the ANC, the ruling party, had developed the RDP the redistribution and development program, which was based on the more socialist freedom charter. But because of the huge loans that were required to work towards reparation from the damage that apartheid had done, all kinds of commitments had to be made, um, neoliberal commitments um, towards global financial institutions in favor of those neoliberal policies. And so that meant that the state was required to become less interventionist. Um, as far as perspectives of social justice, I just want to show you this table, um, which is really useful, which comes from IF. Jim Ife, who writes about community development and is a very popular theorist here in South Africa as well. And he breaks down the different um, perspectives of disadvantage. And what's useful is how when one adopts a certain perspective, where the source of, so to speak, blame lies. And so if you're adopting an individualist perspective, the source of the problem is seen as being individual pathology rather than the structural dynamics that contribute to that. And so if we work 
only in an individualist way the solutions will be seen as behavior modification, even moral exhortation where people are perhaps seen to be lazy and not willing to um, get themselves out of poverty. And of course, a more critical perspective will see the structural issues, the system that in fact um, contributes and, and causes the levels of problems that society finds itself. If we move on to social movements and social work, I want to briefly talk about why it is that we need to turn to social movements. If you think about the history of social work, there always was a commitment to social change as well. If you think about the settlement movement, although today, of course, um, there's some concerns around really problematic racism at the time of the um, settlement movement and Jane Addams has been found to, although she's been a leading figure in how to go about doing social action, um, there have been problems uncovered around racism. So we need to be measured in our um, use of, of that as a shining example of critical and radical social work. But if we argue that social workers should always be on the side of the poor and the oppressed, then we would see that the severe consequences of global neoliberal capitalism requires a much more system destabilizing um, approach and social change efforts, not just the traditional social control and status quo maintaining functions of social work. But the struggles of social movements that have been waged around social and economic justice globally provide us with insights about how to go about um, conducting transformative practice. The energy and the solidarity and the social action and the organization within social movements um, almost lead us to the social action side of community work in social work, but with, of course, a more radical agenda towards social transformation. Um, I've made a list with links to the important social mo movements in the South African context. Um, there are also references at the end, and I'll be talking about some of them briefly um, now, as we um, move towards the last part of this lecture, the Social Work Action Network South Africa was formed during COVID um, as lockdown started. And it is so that the South African government initially did embark on a really excellent um, response to COVID-19. But the, um, the impact on on the struggles that people had socioeconomically were just so exacerbated. The, the, the conditions and the fractures in society that existed before COVID were completely ripped open and exposed because of the measures that had to be taken. Can you imagine people living in informal settlement areas with a tap every few um, hundred meters at times where people didn't have access to water and electricity and social distancing. Um, the, the, the formation of the Social Work Action Network, which is a network of practitioners, social workers, service users, um, academics, um, sort of was a manifestation of a radical perspective um, in South Africa that could be linked to the rich history of social workers in leadership roles during the apartheid struggle. And if you'd like to read a little bit more about that, um, you will be able to find that in the reference list. While many social workers were complicit during apartheid, there was also participation in the anti-apartheid struggle. Another very important social movement that um, is really exemplary in organization and successes is the movement called Abahlali Basim Jondolo, which means the Shack Dwellers Movement. They were formed largely in Durban and have had many successes. 
um, especially when it came to um, a, a legal ruling that the that the huge informal settlement did not have to be demolished in the in the wake of the big shopping development and the slums act was actually changed because of the mobilization the COVID-19 People's Coalition, also formed in 2020, was, has been an excellent social movement with over 200 non-governmental organizations. The um, Social Justice Coalition is another important social movement. Of course, the Black Lives Matter movement, although in South Africa not as hugely um, present in its formation because after all the whole of South Africa has always been based on and rooted on the terrible and racism and anti-racism that came about as part of the liberation struggle but the Black Lives Matter has brought about a whole new emphasis on racism and inequality among um, the black group so to speak, and in South Africa, of course, that is the huge majority rather than minority. Extinction Rebellion is an important social movement and also supported here in South Africa. Another example initiated by social workers is the Black Women's Caucus, formed by social work students, in fact, initially, and they have gone on to do hugely important work around gender-based violence. In the South African context, we, um, of course, have to go a step further in critical and radical social work and not only rely on Western theories to find ways to um, ground our theory in our own context and the anti-colonial theorists that we rely on and can turn to are very much Franz Fanon and Stephen Van Tubico. And there are references to their work, um, the two books there, Black Skin, White Masks, and I Write What I Like, are two texts that form a primary basis around anti-colonial practice that acknowledges the severe and brutal impact at psychopolitical level, at the deep intrapsychic as well as political level of colonialism and how that gets transmitted at an intergenerational uh, level so that it is an ongoing reality today. We rely on the work of um, Latin American theorists as well. Nelson Mal Maldonado Torres is an important theorist for us. And of course, the Fees Must Fall movement and the calls for decoloniality from 19... Um, from 2015 and 16 have also shaped our critical and radical social work practice. I've included some slides where Malcolm Payne actually um, summarizes and has done some infographics on the application of critical and structural practice, he calls it. Um, and these are quite useful when it comes to trying to think about how we go about applying um, these theories in practice. And then we have our reference list with some texts that you can get off the internet if you're interested, and a few videos. Michael LaFollette and Ian Ferguson were behind the initial formation of the Social Work Action Network and a revitalization of critical and radical social work. So there's some interviews there. So that's me and thanks so much. I didn't say I, um, <laughs> my name is Linda Smith and I um, work at um, Pretoria University. I worked before um, at Wits University in South Africa and then in Scotland for six years in Aberdeen. And I uh, practiced as a social worker, as a community social worker and later in the child welfare field and my interest lies in decoloniality. Thanks very much.